Welcome to the RSA, where great change makers of the past inspire the game changers of the present. We're shaping the solutions, the future of work, creating a learning society, fair education, the importance of people and place, and regenerative futures. Shifting systems and challenging norms. Change is hard. But by calling our challenges, ideas and know-how, underpinning them with our proven approach, Our living change approach. Working with and through others to realize change. Together, we can make change happen. Hello everyone, I'm Ian Burbage. I'm Head of Innovation and Change here at the RSA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event. We're marking the final phase of the RSA's Living Change campaign, a celebration of the people, networks, and organizations that are making change happen across the world. Over the course of the last year, events such as the coronavirus pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, the rise of autocratic regimes and the ongoing climate crisis have all exposed the deep fault lines that show us just how much work there is to be done to tackle inequalities across our social, political, economic and environmental systems. In today's event, I'm delighted to welcome to the RSA platform four global change makers working on practical innovations to address these imbalances and respond to issues of diversity, equity, inclusion and justice. We'll hear stories of individuals, communities and organizations seeking and embracing opportunities to tackle disparity through design, innovation, experimentation and renewal. So I'm excited to introduce today's panel to you. Fred Brown is President and CEO of the Forbes Funds, a philanthropic organization focused on strengthening the management capacity and impact of community nonprofits in Pittsburgh in the US. Fred is also part of the Black Equity Coalition, a network of predominantly black professionals, doctors, researchers, and community stakeholders who are intentional about ensuring that black and brown communities receive accurate and reliable information about COVID-19. Previously, Fred served as president and CEO of the Homewood Children's Village, a place-based approach to children's development through whole family support. And Fred has received global awards and appointments for his innovative work, including recognition by the Club of Rome and the Environmental Justice Leader Award by the Ford Foundation. Fred is a thought leader in innovation, capacity building and sustainable social development and assists a variety of communities and organizations to develop new and innovative programs to empower at-risk populations. Our next panelist is Christopher Murray, CEO of the Young Brent Foundation here in London. The foundation aims to create an evidence-based needs-led community partnership model that unites a diverse voluntary youth sector and creates a strong united voice, equipping its members with the training, resources and financial support they need to increase overall capacity and develop a more sustainable future to benefit young people in Northwest London. Chris has a background in local authority youth work delivery. Most recently, he was a strategic commissioner for the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, where he reviewed and redesigned the youth work offer in the wake of the Grenfell tragedy and was youth programs and projects manager for Young Hackney. Next is Courtney Savi Lawrence, a leader, advisor and facilitator of inclusive innovation strategy and systemic and circular design for sustainable and regenerative development. 
Courtney has lived, worked and traveled across more than 70 countries in pursuit of positive social and environmental impact, using design and participatory based approaches to shift systems. Courtney is the co-founder and project lead for the Circular Design Lab in Bangkok and has worked with the UNDP Asia Pacific Regional Innovation Center as head of exploration. For the past eight years, she has been Asia based working in the social impact sector as an entrepreneur, consultant, university lecturer, and co-founder of the innovation company, DSIL Global. And we'll also be hearing from Roya Maboub, who can't be with us today, but has sent her contribution via video. Roya is the co-founder and CEO of Digital Citizen Fund, which aims to increase women's technological literacy and improve employment and educational opportunities for girls and children in developing countries. She is the first female CEO of a tech company in Afghanistan and was named in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2013 for her work in building internet classrooms in high schools in Afghanistan. Roya formed and led the Afghan Girls Robotics team who have won international recognition and awards for their work she sits on the advisory board of Forbes School of Business of Ashford University, the Resolution Project, and the Global Thinkers Forum. I think you'll agree we have an amazing panel, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome Fred, Chris, Courtney, and Roya to the RSA today. So much experience in the room, and I'm excited to hear from everyone. So I'll kick off by inviting our panelists to share a bit more about their work. Fred, if I can invite you to speak first. And thank you very much. This is a great honor on behalf of the Forbes Funds Board, our founding organization, the Pittsburgh Foundation, which much gratitude. We appreciate this opportunity. 37 months ago, I was selected as the first person of color to lead the Forbes Funds. Um, when I came on board, my initial focus was to create an analysis of the nonprofit sector in which approximately 2,500 nonprofits in Southwestern PA lie within the social framework of human services and community development. My goal after 38 years of doing this work was to increase the nonprofit's framework by looking at its effectiveness and efficiency. So I executed a geospatial grant making map after I did a 100 day listening tour to capture all of the positive and not so positive uh, responses from the community. In 100 days, I listened to 1,000 people um, representing a cross sector of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic strata, corporations, institutions, nonprofit leaders, governmental agencies, and universities. From that geospatial grant making map, <clears throat> we created a framework to pivot. At the same time, I was selected to participate in the London School of Systems Change. And our goal was really to look at how we optimize systems. We froze our assets, restructured our grant making, partnered with the CRAB, the Community Research Advisory Board, and created a framework that allowed us to remove implicit bias so that our grant making reflected the challenges within our region based upon our geospatial grant making map. The London School of Systems Change provided us with our initial pivot which allowed us to increase our grant making by 400% in the first four, uh, four quarters as we began to uh, reinstitute our focus. Um, as a result of that work, we learned very quickly that despite our growth and ambition, we were making the sector more effective and efficient, but not human beings. And so we had the unique opportunity and experience to work with Nora Bateson out of Sweden and the International Basin Institute. And we started to look at warm data labs and I was able to train 30 people from around the world in conjunction with NOR in the city of Pittsburgh to look at transcontextual applications. That framework allowed us to create our second pivot, um, which allowed us to explore the liminal realm and look at how we build the capacity of the sector based upon creating a level playing field. That pivot, ran into a headstorm when COVID hit. And as a result of COVID, we partnered with Nora again to create something called People Need People, uh, which was a digital version 
of Warm Data Labs. We facilitated 42 community sessions, two hours a piece to really dig more deeply into the state and well being of our communities. Shortly into that pivot, as you guys know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many other uh, African Americans began to experience um, what we've experienced for 400 years in America untimely deaths as a result of aggressive behavior by police officers and other stakeholders. As such, I wrote an open letter. Um, to the world about when you're a person of color and you can't walk away. And as a result of that letter, I received a lot of support from around the world to re-engage in a more succinct fashion to address social phenomena. As such, um, we began to explore, at this time I was working on a sister city collaboration with Sus Tunisia with our partner, the Department of the Future, with Mark Gonzalez. And I called Mark and said, Mark, I'd like for us to consider shifting our focus from our sister city collaborative to some type of anti-racism platform. He agreed, um, my board read the letter. As a result of my letter, my board adopted an anti-racism framework for the Forbes funds, which fueled our ability to make this pivot. So this would be our third pivot. This pivot allowed us to explore an international anti-racism institutional wireframe cohort we launched it in January, and we had 158 companies and organizations and institutions from five countries participate in the inaugural launch. And today we have 75 people and institutions from five countries participating in a year-long cohort. At the same time, 59 weeks ago, um, public officials addressed me about the lack of testing for people of color in the city of Pittsburgh as a result of COVID. All of this is transpiring at the same time. And so um, I convened a group of stakeholders, epidemiologists, epigeneticists, bioethicists, researchers, community leaders, and another funder to meet with the city and county officials to see if we can broker a collaboration to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of their testing. Our initial scan revealed that in a community of color where we had essential workers, there had been approximately 16 COVID tests but in a neighboring community full of people who were sheltering in place, a white community, um, there had been 152 tests administered. And so I was very concerned about the disproportionate analysis. As such, um, convened this meeting. The initial meeting did not go well. And so we um, pushed that meeting uh, to the governor's office and had a chance to actually meet with Dr. Levine, who was the Secretary of the Department of Health. Uh, she appreciated our push and model and began to meet with us monthly. Uh, 59 weeks later, we convened eight COVID task force teams to constitute over 200 doctors, epidemiologists, researchers, community leaders to create a comprehensive continuity of care model that seeks to mitigate not just COVID, but look at the comorbidity issues which uh, reflect the disproportionate impact of COVID in communities of color. Over the same period, we began to read analyze our work over what we would call a 29 year inflection point analysis. And so we looked at 10 critical frameworks, um, armed civil unrest in 2020, rental and mortgage moratorium being lifted by 2021, COVID impact and recovery initiatives by 2022, racial equity ecosystem being implemented by 2023, income inequality being addressed by 2024, AI and machine learning being implemented by 2025, the potential collapse of Medicare in 2026, climate change 2030, minority shift to in the US to the majority 2040, 2048, the potential collapse of our oceans being overfished, and 2050, 70% of the world's population moving to the urban, urban corridor. As a result of these macro level analysis, we began to align with the city of Pittsburgh, a framework around um, the UN SDGs. Uh, we use two frameworks in our analysis, the social determinants of health and equity. We reverse engineered the outputs to the UN SDGs. In 2018, we partnered with the city of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh became the second US city to adopt the UN SDGs. We then pivoted all of our grant working activity around those two frameworks so that we can create a micro 
and micro uh, grant application to see how our resources are moving the needle in those areas. So today we find ourselves at the precipice of this unique opportunity um, where we have to regalvanize our society around a, a common threat. That common threat is our very existence in the world. And so our work at this particular time is really invoking the citizen to play a critical role. My partners and, and comrades in the BEC, the Black Equity Coalition, have been working for 59 weeks unpaid. So these are volunteers that have contributed over $3.5 million in assets to the equation. And it's just another demonstration about when you galvanize people around a North Star was possible. So today I'm humbled by being on this panel. Moreover, I'm interested in how we can learn and grow. We also, at the same time, I was saying closing partner with Soma Soho from We in the World, um, to create a new partnership with her, which we launched. We're in the world business platform. And as a result of our anti-racism cohort, uh, we will be doing some international uh, forecasting TED Talk-like activity uh, to really demonstrate how organizations shift from DE and I training to institutional cultural shifts. And we really uh, want to honor DE and I training but believe DE and I in and of itself is a tool to name the problem. It doesn't change culture. And so our work is really around systemic change within organizations and institutions. And so if you take everything I just said and you put that into a continuum, we function every day at the micro, meso, macro, and global level, looking at informal, mediated, and formal service delivery units. If you stack those things up, um, Horizontally, we seek to create a vertical integration process to regulate the speed and velocity of each of those systems so that we create real-time feedback loops that drive policy change from the bottom up, looking at community engagement processes. Our process is really around optimizing existing resources, using trusted stakeholders and community partners to rebuild the community's trust in the system and to partner with the system and a long-term strategy to address social phenomena. Thank you. Fred, thank you. Really inspiring. And uh, I'm listening to your story, wondering how you managed to get all that done in a, <laughs> in, a in a week and a year. And it's clearly your, your, your support from your connections and everybody else that, that buys into that North Star that you described. As you were speaking, uh, I was just reflecting on it, and then you ended up talking about the sort of different levels at the micro level, the meso level, the macro level. And as you were talking, I was thinking, you, I, I'm hearing you describe your role almost as one of those brokers between the real sort of grassroots need, but also being able to then plug that into conversations with those with the power to do something about it. And and, and that I think is crucial to the work that, that, that we're all doing and all thinking a, a, about at the moment. Thank you. That's 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 great, uh, Fred. I'm going to now hand over to Chris to share some insights from his work. Chris, hi. Thank you for that, Ian. And um, like like Fred has said, uh, it's a great honour to be here to share some of the insights from Young Brent Foundation and some of the work that I've done in the past. I won't go too far back. We could be here all day, but I will share some insights over the years that have led me to this particular juncture. Because uh, nothing stands alone. We all on the coattails of other heroes and primarily my, my parents were my first heroes. So I want to pay homage to, to them first in the middle of this pandemic and this particular difficult journey for certainly for people of color, certainly for families who are from uh, overseas who live in the UK and in other parts of the world. Um, this particular journey over the last 12 months have highlighted the disproportionate impact on healthcare and how communities are impacted by uh, lack of in, insight and support around their understanding of how the world works. Systemically, if you're from communities that have struggled to engage with school, with healthcare, with employment opportunities, it can be quite difficult to then trust the very people to put the vaccination and the, the potential cure to something that could um, change the world's view. And so we're part of that journey as well in Young Brent Foundation. Um, we're a place-based charity. Uh, we primarily work to support the 89,000 children and young people in Northwest London. 
Um, it's quite a large London borough. If you don't know London fairly well, it's in the Northwest Corridor. And um, we have some interesting features, primarily Wembley Stadium, if you are into soccer. We have um, 49 different nationalities. We have over 150 languages spoken in the borough, which makes it extremely diverse. And one of the challenges that we have as, a, as an area and as a community is to understand each other's issues and potential solutions to those potential issues. So as a place-based charity um, and as an infrastructure, infrastructure charity that provides uh, some of the key tenants to support around funding, around capacity building, around building support mechanisms and structures so that the voice of children and young people could be heard all the way through any particular system. The challenges are a multitude, and I'm just gonna focus on three. I took over the, the running of this particular organization um, two years ago when we had 49 different KPIs. Uh, we now have three. And the reason for the three, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail, but it basically sums up when the system is too clogged with a lots of variance, it's very difficult to navigate what's best and how to support families who are struggling with some of those intersections in, in their lives. And it's not just about economics, which plays a major part. It's not just about education, again, which plays a major part, but it's a dovetail of all of those. And then you mirror that with some of the other intersections that young people may have to face within their family home, within their communities, and you begin to realize that actually there are only two or three things that we really need to focus on to drive change. So the first one I wanted to focus on was around education. So within our organization, I want to really focus on the formal structures that's within a school context, the informal structures, those spaces where young people interact with um, adults who have their best interests at heart with relationships of voluntary. And we really want to underpin and understand what happens for young people outside of the school day, but it's still formally and informally uh, delivered. And then the non-formal, where groups of young people are really interested in a particular theme, a particular hobby, but they're not really getting the time to deliver that in a school context or, or even at their local youth club or youth and community space. So we need to provide them with those opportunities for growth and development. And this is about being ambitious for, for young people. The second one for us is a little bit more tricky, which is around environment. And the way I would frame it, um, with all due respect to uh, our uh, esteemed colleagues, uh, Greta Thornburg, um, this is more about the systems around environment, not the environment itself. So the physical spaces where young people may live, the social environment that who they have to interact with, and, and that's in the stairwell, that could be walking home, that could just be navigating how to get to and fro uh, employment opportunities. And then the third bit for us is the political environment. How do we encourage children and young people to be more politically aware and understand how systems work? And they can work for them or work against them, but you do need to understand how systems work. And we have a role to play in unpicking and dissecting that to empower children and young people. And then the third E for us is around employment. Fundamentally, you know, to be part of a society that's growing and developing, you need the opportunities for employment that can move you from point A to point B in your thinking. No one says it has to be a, a place in academia or be a big sports star, but be proud of whatever it is that you choose to do in your life. And can we support the development of children and families through their family makeups, through their communities to be proud of who and what they can and should be? So those are our three E's. They're not particularly difficult. They're not going to change the world independently. But with the backdrop of COVID, it has highlighted that actually a poor set of circumstances can drive all those three things at the same time. Lots of young people in Brent didn't have access to digital technology when schools closed. Lots of young people's families were furloughed because their families were in hospitality or in what I will class as the, the frontline occupations that keep the wheels moving. You know, working on a transport system our Uber drivers, you know, the, the entertainment sector, it had a massive impact on those families. And then the third thing was around the environment. Families just did not know what they could and couldn't do. Poverty Commission was drafted a report by Lord Best in, in Brent in June of 2020, two months into um, the COVID as we know it now. 
And what was really interesting at that time was everything that came out in that poverty report was everything that was happening to communities of color and minority communities from what would be now known as the um, Eastern European communities. And it was such a stark reality check for everybody that what COVID did in less than six weeks was to put up a light to all the inequalities across society. And it did it literally overnight. And we are still feeling those reverberations now. So it's with that in the back of my mind, it's what can we do differently and how can we improve the, the quality of life for children and young people as they grow through those three E's as we see it. And we have three intersections. You'll, you'll see three is a key theme for me. It just makes my life a lot easier. But primarily the first one is around intercultural dialogue. You know, we can talk about color and we can talk about um, disparity in society around the notion of race and whatever that may mean. But what we're really talking about is our understanding of culture and understanding of difference. If we want to understand, we need to celebrate. If we need to celebrate, we need to really unpick what we mean by culture and the intercultural play. If we're talking about color as something different, we are talking about racism. And again, if we had more time, we would spend more than two or three hours just talking about the notion of race and racism, which is real. But what we're going to focus on is the cultural aspect and what brings young people to, to the table. The second thing that we really wanted to focus on was what Kimberly Crenshaw would call intersectionality. And it's those places of divergence where society, race, or the notion of race, wealth, uh, collide, and whether or not those communities are all benefiting at the same rate at the same time. And we want to shine a light on that piece of work within the, the charity that I run. And then the third function is really about complex trauma. And again, uh, W.D. Du Bois will call this around conscious or unconscious bias and how we may or may not see ourselves and how many hats you may need to wear as you navigate that stairwell from the 15th floor all the way down to the ground to be the human being you want to be and then having to re-engage with that on the way home to be the child that the parents left in the morning. It's really quite complex for children to, to navigate all those different intersections, all those opportunities for growth and development. And something as adults we may take for granted or we are buried years ago when we went through to some of those issues of dealing with race or racism, dealing with intersectionality and dealing with the complex ability to navigate. We are now seeing issues around health and well-being being played out for, for children and young people and in their families. Um, and we will maybe have another two or three years of this before we really understand the complex nature post-COVID. I don't think we're quite there yet. But one of the things I did want to touch on, which was around our particular formula for success, as we will call it, which is just four things, really. Being clear and, and with integrity. Listening and using very clear dialogue. Being authentic in action and being reflexive. And if we hold those four things up into any conversation, then we have half a chance of being heard and being understood. Um, we heard earlier around listening projects and, and the benefits of that. There is absolutely no reason why that doesn't happen every day in every situation. It is so important to learn to listen. It's so important to be understood, but it's more important to really unpick what was just being said. The juxtaposition of um, George Floyd and the more recent news today, this very day of another incident, another two incidents, um, just highlights how much work there needs to be done. And with that, one of the things I suppose that we would need to do is to focus on how we listen. Can I hand that back to Ian? Thanks, Chris. Really inspiring and some really uh, heartfelt and um, impo important messages coming through in what you're saying. Really taken as well by you know, too often we, for, for some reason, we, I, I feel that we don't seem to understand or give due weight to the context within which people are trying to lead their lives. And uh, your talk about the importance of environment, not just um, seeing that as a green space, but actually it's the space in which people live that can be quite threatening or can be a place where you don't feel safe for many. Also, I think that, that that links back to what I heard Fred talk about with the social determinants of health. You know, we still see things in silos, don't we? And, and if nothing else, I hope COVID teaches us that, that we need to get beyond that. 
Uh, Chris, thanks so much for that. I'm going to uh, hand over and invite Courtney to share some thoughts for us. Courtney. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ian and the RSA for the invitation. And it's really been quite a privilege and, and humbling to hear the systemic work that's happening um, through the leadership of Fred and Christopher as well. So um, thank you so much. So my name is Courtney Savi Lawrence and I'm based here out of uh, Southeast Asia. I've been working across the spectrum of grassroots to government for several years, um, quite recently with the UNDP regional innovation team. And at that same time, I was also um, coming out of also having been working and teaching at a university leading human centered design for social innovation. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story um, around how alternative capital, social capital, idea capital, political capital um, can really root in a community and not necessarily through the functions of an organization, uh, a company, a social enterprise, an NGO, a charity, but in a, a different type of model. And I, and I come at that lens as an experiment because I have founded my own company. I have worked with large bureaucracies and so at the very edge of 2018, pre-COVID world, of course, um, here out of Asia, when one of the questions that myself and three other faculty members where I was teaching asked ourselves is, you know, who else is curious around using a, a systemic approach, systemic design specifically, if we look at tackling systems um, like waste management or air pollution or these big complex uh, issues that often at a human scale feel quite overwhelming. And, and communities are, are literally day to day trying to, rightly so, uh, make sense of the world and, and literally have survival on their own rights. So when we think about environmental issues um, of the commons, uh, what does that look like? And, and how might a collective group of people in, in cities or even rural communities come together and, and tackle that? So that was our curious question. And so Circular Design Lab is the story I'm sharing. Um, we really had three main goals. Number one was to, to create community. Number two was to actually build capability and capacity around imagining future possibilities. So how do we really transfer our paradigms from the default that we understand today or the status quo that we understand today and really as a collective forecast or, or build the bridge to something that's different that we actually do desire um, with intention and then thirdly, to get a little bit more specific, our process was how might systemic design be one of the tools, a framework for us to unlock space that would help us collectively identify leverage points that would shift the system. And so our kind of guiding principles uh, were really around that. And, and ultimately, the, one of the key questions here was how do we tap into the latent talent, latent wisdom that people across the city of Bangkok, we're starting in Bangkok here, um, might be able to contribute. So we started with um, just literally us putting it out there to the community. Um, we had a, a, an event, which was a live R&D session around um, waste management, which may not sound too sexy, but um, when you think about the millions of people around the region here specifically, where there are disparate, let's say, functions of waste collection, but really uh, not much recycling going on and also not much of a organized way of managing that. And we're a growing metropolis um, out of many others in the region. So it's a curious question. And what we brought together ended up having about 100 people come to our first event and then people signing up for our workshops. And so I'm going to share two quick images to put a little bit of context around that. The first one is really about what I was just mentioning. This notion that you may have seen this, this diagram, it's not brand new. It's about, I think around 10 years old, it's the Burkana two loops model. But when we think about the dominant system and where we wanna go, you know, how do we imagine and, and, and get to the space of experimentation together, um, especially leveraging diversity of perspective and diversity of backgrounds? And how do we build bridges for that transition? So Circular Design Lab is specifically, let's say positioned to really, um, cultivate a pathway for this transition. And so the second thing I wanted to just show, I'm a visual person, a visual learner as well. Um, so I just think that it could be a little bit helpful. But one of the questions is, you know, when we start with a workshop, um, sometimes we may say, well, where is this even going to go? And, and how might that actually evolve? 
And so what we did is we did take stock and, and you're not meant to necessarily understand everything as an overwhelming visual, but um, a few months ago, we, if you took at the top left corner of this visual, that is our starting point. We literally started with just a question, who might be interested in this? And then from there, we had our 1.0 lab to build prototypes in concert with the big picture vision of a systemic uh, perspective of where we may go. And what we found is that over the course of that experience, um, we did get interesting insights. We did do ethnography and action research and all the things about listening to the community that um, Christopher was mentioning and Fred was mentioning just as much. The fact of the matter is people wanted to continue. And so this is why I point around alternative capital. We chose, um, we built a governance structure, but we actually had the conversation and nobody wanted to register. We wanted to keep this transparent agenda living and free and liberated from finance and liberated from a certain type of conventional or traditional governance structure that might be used in this kind of situation typically. Um, the story I wanna to transition to though is where we're moving with national policy change. So we started with the waste management and then we said, oh, wow, there's a lot of people quite interested. Our community is growing to over uh, you know, 400 people interested at this stage. And so we, we designed a 2.0 lab to say who else is interested in air pollution as well as unsustainable fast fashion. And what we discovered is um, through that process, and I'll share a little bit of my experience with the, the air pollution efforts in closing, um, we ended up identifying two leverage points um, through the experience of the workshops. And those leverage points included policy change, national scale top down, as one could imagine, that would be a fast way to change. And then secondly, education and awareness, understanding that environmental um, principles are not typically in the foundations of the curricula for uh, the formative years of many, many youth in this region. And so long story short, um, after thousands of volunteer hours, this again is a 100% volunteer driven effort, unpaid effort by dozens and dozens of people contributing. Um, to put it a little bit further into uh, a rich picture, we also have, let's say about 80% um, local Thai and then around 20% foreigners like myself. But we would have these meetups, um, we'd have conversations with unusual suspects. We would sometimes pay um, those that may be working deeply in the community to come to even share um, because it's an opportunity cost for them to join. But um, at the end right now, what we're working on is a citizen driven um, clean air bill that if we have 7,000 more signatures to go, we'll have this, this legislation tabled at parliament. And how did we get there? Um, it started with the workshops, the second round of workshops, and where we met the co-founder of the Thailand Cleaner Network, who had been steadily working with another group on the legislative piece. And so this last image I'm sharing here is just, um, luckily uh, COVID has been up and down in, in Thailand. So we have had gatherings face to face, but this was the launch event for obtaining uh, citizen-driven signatures. Unfortunately, it cannot be digital, it has to be analog, but we did uh, participatory design, clean air futures workshops, um, performance arts, creative edge as well for all of the conversations that we are trying to bolster and, and reframe something that feels so large, so abstract at times, and something honestly that we say government needs to be taken care of, and we put it down into the hands of everyday people. So this is the story of Circular Design Lab. It's an ongoing living lab, uh, ongoing living experiment. And um, at this stage, we do not necessarily know where we're going, and that's a very interesting space to proceed from, because often we have our theory of change and we have our two-year plans, our three-year plans, and right now we're living with a very organic nature and um, I'm building from there. So thank you so much for your, for your invitation to share a little bit of the story. I've learned a lot already from the other panelists and uh, looking forward to the continued conversation as well. Thanks, Courtney. It's equally inspirational, so much that I could take from that. Um, your last comment is interesting. I often wonder about whether we truly need a theory of change and a strategic plan to actually um, make difference and make an impact in the world. And I think hearing Fred talk about the need to pivot and be responsive to what's emerging and where the energy is, is, is just as important, if not more so. Um, some other themes I think we could touch on, the importance of the volunteer effort, uh, something that's come out in, in everything I've heard so far and the role of education, not just 
packaged up formally, but actually more so what that informal learning looks like when you start to engage people around something they're passionate about. Um, this just fascinating. Uh, however, I have to uh, move on. And it's important that we hear from Moya, who has recorded her story for us. Um, and so we'll hear next from Moya. An inspiration and ingenuity come in most unlucky places. Those who are writing off by the system or uh, disregarded as a source of possibility may be the very one who have a way to bring the peace to the world or end to poverty. The mind of a child is a source of unlimited potential that waits only to be given tools and guidance to shape it and form it to become as a great scientist, mathematician, or artist. I could have been a nameless unknown woman in Afghanistan. The courageous men and women are here today who lead and dare to dream of a brighter future could have been unknown if they didn't uh, take the first step of the courage. Just so the world leaders of the future may be still unknown. As a girl growing up in Afghanistan, I live in a fear, fear of the conservative who come and burn our books, fear of unknown future, fear of never escaping the colorless, fear of writing life that was all I knew. I live in a fear but hope born in my heart. I start to imagine. I start to imagine all the devices where I could read whatever I wanted and then make those books to be disappear. In my mind, this would prevent anyone who wanted to keep me from the knowledge for which I was so uh, desperately hungered. My hunger gave me courage to go to the places that other girls wouldn't want to go. Courage led me to go to only, to only in a cafe in Herat at a very young age where I saw for the first time computer. I saw this magic box that connect you with the people, uh, uh, with the outside people and then you can talk with them and you can find any information that you are looking for. This box would be, uh, could be the answer to my problem. The realization of my dreams, and that day I stood and looked at the computer, I couldn't see, but I could imagine a future that was within my grasp. At that moment, I made it in mind to make somehow technology be the center of my career. I have been blessed with a father who believed in me and supported me through the schools, and I went to the computer science, I graduated from there. And then I started uh, uh, my own uh, company. My goal as a CEO was to hire women to prove to the world that what a woman can do even in Afghanistan. By now my dream are becoming my reality. I saw myself as a leader of a new movement in Afghanistan, a movement with the potential to change the, the world for millions of the girls and women uh, in conservative countries. My goal my journey to CEO wasn't without obstacles and challenges. I believe those, actually those obstacles and challenges are the things that made who I am today. There are, there were building blocks, the things that I had to overcome uh, who I need to be. I faced real persecution because of what I stood for. Uh, this persecution drove me to be out of my country, forcing me to relocate it to save my life and those who around of me. This was one of the greatest uh, challenges or obstacles that I faced, but I mean, this was worth it. I knew by now that my dream were only the beginning. I decided to start to show some fun uh, with one goal, to see the technology as an accessible option for everyone, especially for the women in conservative country. I believe that everyone deserves equal opportunities and education regardless of their gender and social status, on with the dream. Everyone deserves the change to let their courage shine. Uh, with digital cell phone, I choose the pathway of servant leadership. As a servant to others, I show a way by example. My choice to serve those around of me came from my uh, inner passion to see that the world change for better and for every individual. We have started to provide a training for 16,000 of the girls in Afghanistan. We provide training to learn about how the girls learn about how to work with the computer to level that they can uh, build games, working with, uh, with robotics. They learn about digital, uh, the blockchain training. They also learn how to manage the money from the level of home to level of entrepreneurship. 
We had more than hundreds of them that we started here on as startups. One of the greatest projects of this year that I'm really most proud of that is Afghan Gas Robotic Team that we started this program in 2017. This team uh, uh, is the, of the uh, team of the young women that became a symbol of the courage that inspired thousands. After the, their travel into the first global international competition of robotics in the United States against some incredible art, uh, they have actually captured uh, the imagination of the world with their inspiring message of hope and determination. Before they entered the world stage and won uh, the hearts of millions, uh, the idea of the girls uh, coming to robotics in Afghanistan was unthinkable. Uh, there was no chance it could, it would ever happen until it did. They showed uh, that the women who are empowered and believed in could achieve amazing things. As they continued their revolutionary work, they continued to find solutions to the world uh, problems in technology. They also started to working on open source ventilator and UVC robots to fight to help to fight with COVID-19 pandemic. They are only just beginning. Beyond their message of hope and female empowerment, they are changing the world because of the investment that we choose to make in them. Today, we are working on to building the first uh, for the future and to building the first Islam school, uh, which we call it the Afghan Driven Institute. We, are, we have the groundbreaking chance uh, to train the next generation of the Afghan youth in high quality of STEM and robotics that offering them a place uh, on the world stages. And for that, we needed the support of the government, which right now we have it. Progress for the youth, especially girls, needs, needs to be a national and regional priority to secure lasting peace and prosperity. We simply cannot let the past uh, happen again. A new, in the brown new world, young women will need to uh, able to seek the opportunities for building individual wealth and in the process stimulate uh, high value economics model for the nations. This model of education and uh, prosperity will allow young women to success in the businesses and support their families and communities. All the newbies have seen enormous progress in our programs that we have uh, to digital self fund. Every day, young women are learning how to manage finance, create new technologies, and follow their dreams and passion. Education is a gene for our regional development and peace prosperity, but it must be good quality of education that shape for the future. We needed to support of we needed the support of the government, communities, and private sectors. And I believe that technology and education uh, in this time, uh, uh, like what we are going to provide an Af uh, Afghan Dreamer Institute, will allow young girls and boys to be trained in high quality, cutting edge uh, technology and media. They will compete on the world stages for development of world changing innovation and the progress. Thanks, Roya. Um, such an inspiring story. We often talk about innovation and risk in what we're doing, and yet um, here's Roya talking about how for her dream to become a reality, she faced persecution for what she stood for, what she stood for which is a sobering reality for me anyway, um, so inspirational. Let's dig into some of the themes and ideas that, that we've um, touched on in a little bit more detail with, with a couple of questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to open up just with some thinking about the word innovation itself, because often I think it can be one of those words that's overused to the extent that people can tune out what it is we actually mean, what we're actually trying to do. I love the fact that the four stories we've heard, for me, really bring that to life, that it's not just a theoretical set of processes, but it's something quite practical and tangible. But I'd love just to hear from each of you in turn what innovation as, a, as an idea means to you and whether you think it's any more important, given where we are in the world, um, with a, a global pandemic and all the other challenges we've touched on uh, over the next decade or two. Um, Fred, would you like to kick off? Certainly, thank you. Um, I believe innovation is at the crux of our ability to pivot in particular around this COVID dynamic 
um, COVID has basically revealed for the world the iceberg that many people of color already knew about. Um, at some deeper level, there has to be an awakening to systemic changes that need to take place. The rapid prototyping that needs to occur can most likely occur more seamlessly through innovation. Um, historically, many organizations are based upon waterfall leadership models. And so even when you think about those, my colleagues on this call who are transformational leaders, all of us function in transactional systems. And so what is the bridge that creates the nexus for us to be able to take our thoughts and move them from a micro application to a macro application? Innovation is that tool. I would also say that I believe both Christopher and Courtney highlighted something to me that's critical. What we've learned, it, you know, in the 37 months we've been at, I've been at the helm, I'm more than capable with my team of creating something unique. So I, I would call us a unicorn. But what I realize is when you have this unique thing, we partner with Headstorm to create a new human-centered design framework. We optimize our grant making, then we pivoted again with NOR. We were moving so quickly through rapid prototyping that our partners and colleagues really couldn't keep pace with us. And what, what happens is people say theoretically, I understand what you're doing. I get it. But they can't move physically in a metaphysical way to keep pace with the trajectory because we're both looking at the here and now resolutions and the trajectory and arc that it requires to keep pace with what we know is a growing divide for people of color and dominant culture pedagogy. And so when you think about the constant churning and I, you know, I have to deal with my team and say, the, to me, it's like, People say, well, this is hard. This is hard. Yes, it's, it's different, though. It's like if I, I'm a competitive powerlifter, I was ranked 13th in the world at one time. The first time I went and did yoga, I couldn't complete the class, right? And so it's working different muscles. And so when you think about a waterfall leadership model versus rapid prototyping, it's different, mo it's different muscles being used. And sometimes people comport themselves to say it's difficult and it can't be done, that's not an option. Nobody's coming to save us. People have this illusion that there's somebody that has a switch that they're going to hit a button and save us. I don't see it coming. And if it is, it's taking a long time and we don't have a lot of time left. And so for me, we have to, it is incumbent upon us to use innovation as a tool to bring as many stakeholders to, as possible to change this condition. And so for me, I will close this my opening statement by saying, Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the same energy that created the problem. What we've done historically is Europeans represent 10% of the global demographics, but they make up like 90% of the decision-making. And it's, it's boggling to me that that happens. And yet Europeans believe that they're doing the best work for the world when they haven't tapped into the latent assets of other people who survived for millennium doing things differently. And so this notion of what Einstein refers to as collective genius, which is what we've been striving to do at the Forbes Funds, is bring a cross-sector of stakeholders together using Nora Bateson's work in the liminal realm to move into this space where we're all equal at solving a problem bigger than this. And what we have to bring to that solution is rapid prototyping and how we bring resilient communities to the table is through innovation. And so we are working with the Nittany AI program at Penn State and another group called UMI Score because we're just as much as we're worried about innovation, we're also very concerned about data sovereignty. And so when you make these quick pivots, you also have to be conscious of what is happening to the consumer as a result of our need and desire to make these pivots. And so we're working concurrently with another group, which I've been working with for about two years on this data sovereignty piece. And we've been looking at innovation and we're about to launch a hackathon um, in the next month. Thanks, Fred. That sounds like fun. Um, Chris, do you have any thoughts on, on innovation? I have many thoughts on innovation, <laughs> uh, but the one that springs to mind and I'll try my best to keep it, to keep it as succinct as I can is I grew up in a time when um, there was literally two TV channels. 
And if I was lucky, there may be a third. And my imagination took me wherever it needed to go. I didn't need at the time, because I don't know what the future looked like, what innovation looked like. We now have every social media platform known to man to create space for creation and produce innovative, beautiful things for people to challenge and to check. But the thing that keeps bringing me back to is um, a thing of my childhood called the Flintstones. If you're a particular generation, you may know what I'm referring to. And they had wheels and the wheel was the fundamental thing that shifted that community from being Stone Age through to innovative, creative beings. And a wheel is a wheel is a wheel, basically. And innovation is how you then use that wheel. It's then how you apply the logic that sits behind the frame of that wheel. And so I use it as a basis of the work that I may do with children and young people, which is nothing is new, but it is done differently. Nothing is brand new, but it can be done differently to a brand new outcome. And that for me is really what the space occupies. We do a thing in, in Brent, which is predominantly what we call appreciative inquiry. We are not really looking to solve any particular problem, but we are asking questions of it. And through that diagnostic tool, you will find a solution because it appears. And once it appears, you can then begin to unpick that answer. That's innovation. That's creating dialogue that is pure, honest, authentic, and reflexive. It's in action. And it's so hard to demonstrate that to power brokers. I am going to use the very similar language to Fred, maybe not as controversial, but I wish I had the confidence around having a Eurocentric or, or a worldview around particular issues and how we may frame that particular view with the power brokers in mind. So you design with the power broker's approval. So I suppose in one sense, I already have parents. I don't need another set of parents. And so from a Eurocentric point of view, data and those who own the data will determine whether something's successful or not. And if we look over history, over the last 10, 20,000 years, it hasn't always come out of Europe. I mean, I'm sure uh, Egyptologists will, will put a stake in the claim in that. I went to Cambodia a few years ago and I was amazed at some of the architecture there. That's innovation. That's beauty in action. And somehow we've lost the sense of looking back to go forward. Not everything in the past was painful. The last four or 500 years, I wouldn't disagree. But if you go back before that, there were some beautiful things that was happening across the globe and we need to tap into that. There are 149 different languages, like I said earlier in, in Brent. Um, and we have to find a way to communicate with all parties. And so the innovation is in the creation of the conversation. And the innovation has always been about the articulation of that particular strand. But I think the thing that's been missing for us really has been the evidencing of that innovation, the storytelling, the impact that that innovation's created and the difference it's trying to make. And as a sector, working with a voluntary community environment, volunteering isn't a dirty word. Volunteering is the kernel of innovation because you come with a pure essence as to why you're in that space. You're not being driven by economics, you've been driven by change. And if you can tap into that and provide the resourcing around that particular initial um, foray into the thinking, to the processing, you'd be surprised what comes from it. That for me is, in, is creative, inclusive leadership. That for me is about creating a dialogue that enables that innovation to take place. So I suppose for me to wrap that up, a wheel is a wheel, and I thank Fred Frinstone for introducing me to that. But we are where we are, and we now have the digital capacity to have this conversation online because communication is the key. And we are lucky to be able to communicate in such a way and to share our knowledge. But we were able to do that in the past too. And we mustn't forget that. Thanks, Chris. Uh, one of the pieces of work I did last year was looking at foresight and futures. And we really started to unpack the question of who gets to decide about the future? And I'm minded of the question about innovation, who gets to innovate, who's in and who's out? And I think all of those challenges around processes and how they can be uh, engaging and open uh, and listen to a range of voices are crucial. So it's, it's interesting to, to hear some of that come out in, in what I heard you say. I'm gonna invite Courtney to share some words as well. 
Thanks. Great. Well, it's really, again, quite uh, inspiring to can, you know, follow up uh, the other thoughts. And I think we could have a completely, uh, you know, another conversation about what do we even mean about in innovation. Um, in fact, I'm working with two others um, authoring a book on inclusive innovation. Um, so innovation from the standpoint of what does it mean for sure is a buzzword, but buzzwords do exist for a reason. And I think that's valid and, and something to explore. So um, from the standpoint of the value of the language itself, um, to me, I found as a practitioner and as someone also trying to um, facilitate conversations around process, uh, human-centered design, systemic design, um, appreciative inquiry, using liberating structures, um, thinking about all these different tools. It's about capacity and capability to hold space, to, to reflect, which also in our very busy 24 seven notifications, nonstop kind of world um, is something that's quite rare and, and that's required. I think it's a prerequisite. So to the point Fred was making, you can have these um, you know, intentions to, to move fast, to be agile, but if your partners or even your team that, for that matter are not ready to, to reflect um, to think about what is working, what's not working, what's failing, what, why, um, and where should we go? How do we follow that energy? Because energy follows action and action is so powerful. And why are people doing certain things? Um, then honestly, it, it doesn't work well. If you have that framework out there and you say, this is innovation, and we're doing it. That's from my experience. Now on the uh, flip side of that, I've also worked in rural communities in, in Thailand, for example, we were partnered with MIT and, and ran the International Development Design Summit. This is with my previous company. And we worked in a village, uh, there's not even a 7-Eleven. And just to give you context, there's over 8,000 7-Elevens in the country of Thailand, a country of 69 million people. Um, so we're talking about a place that doesn't have very much air conditioning, if at all. And we're running an innovation, uh, creative capacity building, um, summit to see what kind of agricultural innovations might be surfacing from the farmers, from the community, but we never use the word innovation and it worked just as well. So um, I think the hype and the language matters in certain ways, depending on what space you're in. You can also build credibility and, and attract people. I know the Circular Design Lab attracted people because we we're talking about design, innovation, circular uh, economy for that matter. And people are curious, like, what is it? And then you realize it's quite intuitive and there is a nuance to it. So you can get quite sophisticated as well. But to me, it boils down to, I think what um, was said a little bit earlier around these skills, and particularly of deep listening. And one of my favorites, um, I think exercise that I pull a lot of inspiration from is from Theory U and Otto Sharma and the four levels of listening. I, I usually run that kind of exercise, um, sometimes with adults, sometimes with students. But um, if you're not there and you're not able to, to be present to actually listen to not just the content, but even just what's really behind that message, um, we're not going to be where we need to be. Um, and so I find myself sometimes quite frustrated with, um, with the hype, yes. And like I mentioned, um, now working on a book on inclusive innovation. And this is to, I think, to some of the points we we're making a little bit earlier, um, to acknowledge really rich creative solutions already exist. There are innovators out there in the grassroots and even bureaucrats and some policymakers for sure as well, working on it from an upstream standpoint. Um, however, if we don't have the conversation widened about what that means, and it's not just at the top business schools we're talking about it, for example, and we don't make it real in the community and acknowledge that we can really be learning very laterally then um, you know, we're losing our opportunity to move as quickly and as fast as, as I think what Fred's meaning, you know, mentioning, you know, we don't have someone coming in to like switch the button and save us. We have to, we are those people. That's what we have to do. Um, so we have to light the fire and, and be around it and, and listen to each other. So it's a really exciting space. Um, just to put it out there, if you're interested, we're doing uh, learning, stories, learning and stories labs around inclusive innovation starting in Asia, but the intent is to go global um, with what that looks like, what that means. And we're talking about learning through story as well. So it's not only about the academic frameworks and blueprints, and this is step one, two, three, but to humanize it and, um, and bring it back to that kind of level too. So, yeah, sorry. I think I, I'm very passionate about the subject and thinking about it a lot. Um, always playing devil's advocate too. So I'm um, happy to always, you know, continue the chats with others that would be keen to. 
Thanks, Courtney. Um, I really take away that point you make about the importance of story, something I think Chris touched on as well. Evidence too often is just needed as, as numbers and data, but story puts the humanity at the center of what's going on, right? And I think that's just super important. Um, let's, let's finish with a couple of quick fire question rounds. Um, I'm mindful that, that uh, we need to make the most of everybody's time. I'd like, first of all, just to turn to a longer term time horizon. Fred touched on some thinking around what that might look like, um, but I'd love to hear like a quick take on your ambitions in your work and where you see the energy coming uh, to, to help those ambitions come to fruition. Um, Chris, should we kick off with you this time? Yeah, and it's a good term, kick off. Um, so, so for me, the most ambitious we can be is to not have closed doors to, to, to questions. Keep the, the dialogue going and, and, and like I said, the, the presentation of those results will, will appear. So we need to be open to a different way of being. Um, we need to be open to the possibility that something can be done differently and not be frightened by what we call normalcy now to go back to what it was. I'm not quite sure if it was great two or three years ago. This is an opportunity for us to pause and go forward. Um, I would argue that the future does look bright, but it can be quite scary. And it's about feeling that fear and doing it anyway. So being ambitious for me is about taking that deep breath and taking that step. Um, I think imagining the past into the future is probably the wrong solution. Thanks, Chris. Courtney. Oh, I was expecting Fred to go next. Um, okay, so yeah, for, for me, I think um, it's to have the courage to, to be bold and, and to be sustaining with your, your vision, right? Um, and with your intention. There's so many reasons. We have so many negative messages coming at us all the time through the daily news, through the conversations. It's a hard moment in the world. Um, but um, there's nothing like that, that energy that you feel when you are with a team, a community, those that are in it for the cause, the right reasons. And so that to me, that, that propels me. Um, I can't say that I have, uh, as you probably get from what I've been already sharing, I'm not the type to, to map out in hardcore detail what needs to happen, but having that strong intent is number one and, and cannot be, um, that's the common denominator that has to stay. So having that intent to change systems for the positive, that's not going to change. And to find my, keep finding my tribe, expanding the tribe um, all around the world, I think that's what it's about. So um, that's it over on this side. Thanks, Courtney. Fred, I thought I'd bring you in last for a change. Uh, thank you. Um, I really appreciate everybody's feedback. And I really, Courtney, I will be um, co-opting your uh, inclusive innovation statement. Uh, if you give me permission, I think that's very important. I think, um, and to Christopher's analysis, when you think about the opportunities before us, and we don't talk about this, there's this illusion that we're getting back to normal. Like, that's wasted energy. You can't manifest and put energy into something that's already done. You know, we have to look at how we move forward. And I think there's nothing wrong with considering a different paradigm, as I think Christopher alluded to, Eurocentric paradigm, I would offer Afrocentric and universal paradigms to look at cosmology, axiology, and epistemology. But for us, what's aspirational for the work we're doing is, as I shared with you earlier, functions at the micro, meso, macro, and global level. And we're working across at least three hemispheres on a daily basis. And so for us, the way that we see change occurring exponentially is by creating moving systems change focused folks to ecosystems co-creation. And for us using the social determinants of health and equity as guideposts to help us centralize our activity so we can discern within our analysis, how is that collective work moving the needle? And then we can reverse engineer the outputs to create global indicators to the SDGs. We have to create the momentum that we are the change we seek in the universe. And we have to give agency to people who don't even understand that they're contributing to greenhouse gases by false narratives, by um, situations that don't really encompass our best um, step forward. And then how do we build a shared North Star 
And I don't think there's one North Star. I think there's a multitude of North Stars. When you think about the difference in dichotomy between race, ethnicity, and social economic strata, there's certainly one for humanity. But how do we create the equilibrium where you take a group of people that's been disinvested in or oppressed for hundreds of years, put them in the same room with people with privilege and say, now we can start off and have a courageous conversation and we can get things done. There has to be a way that we do more to create a level setting process that requires us to see each other as brothers and sisters and equals so that we can co-create. And I think that's the work that we're pioneering and working on. And we believe that these kind of conversations allow us to look at what the role of inclusive innovation can be with helping us have courageous conversations that move from the theoretical to the metaphysical. Thanks, Fred. I think we're all going to take away inclusive innovation. Um, I think we can also hear from Roya, who's pre-recorded a piece for us. And uh, for your questions, I think that the support of the government private sector is needed to system-wide investment in STEM and secondary higher education, which kind of shape a trajectory for job creation and economic progress. And ultimately, through that, we can have more inclusive and peaceful societies. And for your second questions, I would say that unless we work together, the future I'm sitting before you today will never become a reality. It's only a dream unless we work together to achieve it. So I think that we needed to realize that the partnership is the key to the success. Thank you. It's just great to hear from Moya there. I think we're probably out of time, which means for me at least, that's a great note to finish on. Um, I think working together is at the heart of what we've been talking about and listening to, and not just in our formal roles. We heard a lot about the value of contributions that people give uh, in a voluntary time uh, because it's something that people care about, because they buy into that notion of a, of a shared North Star, as, as Fred was saying, uh, a shared sense of energy and action, as Courtney was talking about, or a shared sense of place, like we heard from Chris. And at the end of the day, no one individual has an answer in isolation. The, you know, the challenges we face are too complex for that. And that's where notions such as those wider determinants of health, the, the, the context, the environment in which we live is crucial. Uh, for me, this has been a fascinating uh, discussion. It's just a shame we couldn't uh, keep chatting all afternoon or morning or evening, depending on the different time zones. Um, but I do have to say thank you so much to the panellists for sharing their time with us today. Uh, it's just so appreciative of, of your insights uh, and, and what we've heard from you in, in the stories that you've shared. For those of you watching, you'll find links to delve deeper into Fred, Courtney, Chris and Roya's work in the chat bar and on the RSA website. I'd encourage you to follow them on Twitter if you aren't already to make those connections and keep in touch with their brilliant work. You can catch up with other events, blogs and podcasts in the RSA's Living Change campaign on our website. And finally, we'd love to hear how you and your neighbourhood, your workplaces, your communities have responded, um, those of you listening along, watching along, how have you adapted to the kind of challenges like those we've explored today? How much of what we've heard resonates? We'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, and your stories of change using our Twitter hashtag, RSA Change. For me, it's been a fantastic conversation. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Um, it remains for me to say again, thank you to Fred, Courtney, Chris, and Roya, and thank you all for watching.